Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have the pleasure of chairing this afternoon's session um, from Moira Sarsfield of Imperial College London, and her presentation is titled Short and Fat or Long and Thin, the Educational Impact of the Shape of the Timetable. So over to you, Moira. Thank you, Fazana. And um, yes, the title is Short and Fat or Long and Thin, and it's looking at how how we choose to teach within the timetable will have an impact on um, on the education for our students. So um, I'm going to ask you to interact um, via the, the channel, the, the comments channel in YouTube. So please don't be shy. And I've also included here my Twitter handle and my um, email address if anyone wants to contact me at any point in the future. Um, so I'm going to be thinking about the timetable um, in the big picture. So looking at formal education and looking at the timetable over the course of the year. So the terms and semesters and how we teach across those, those um, time periods, not about the day-to-day -day timetable. And so I'm going to start with a question to get you all in the mood, which is, why do schools go back earlier in Scotland than they do in England? So please do um, type in the chat if you have any thoughts or ideas about why schools go back earlier in Scotland than they do in England. I think they've already been back for about a month in Scotland, whereas in England where students and um, the pupils are just going back to school now. So, um, <laughs> because we start the holidays early, <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, uh, do we know why um, why they, they would start the holidays earlier and why they would finish the holidays earlier? Yeah, because of the, the daylight issues and the weather and the climate and all of these things. And where I come from originally is the northeast of Scotland. And here there was always traditionally a two week tatty hawking holiday, which was the time where the families would be used to um, harvest the potatoes. So a lot of the early reasons of why the timetables were set as they were were for agricultural issue, agricultural reasons or practical reasons. But there is a question about whether that's actually a pedagogically sound reason for, um, for having the timetable that way. And I know that there are issues with school children. They say that sometimes school children forget a lot of what they've learned over a long summer holiday. So... Um, we'll have a look at two different options for timetables. So this could be a term and we're looking at the whole term and we could have three modules that run concurrently and are long and thin with several teaching sessions per week for the whole term. Or we could have a term where we have three modules that run one after the other. So you do all your studying on, on one module, you complete that module and then you move on to the next one. And these are what we call the long thin and the short fat um, modes of delivery. So three modules per term, they've got the same content more or less, the same credit value, um, ECTSs, um, the same number of face-to-face -face hours and personal study hours. The only thing that really differs is the shape, whether they're taught concurrently or consecutively. And we can call the long thin ones the traditional method and the short fat ones are sometimes called a block or intensive method of delivery. And that's what we're going to be thinking about in this session. So the first thing I'd like you to do next, or the next thing I'd like you to do, is to think about formal learning that you've done and think about how the timetable was arranged. Was it long, thin modules? If so, how many did you have at one time? Or was it short, fat modules? And if they were short, fat modules, then how many weeks did you study one subject for? Or was it some other approach? Was it some mixed approach? So hopefully you can um, tell us that in the chat now, please.
That's it. How was the term the timetable arranged when you were studying or if you're studying now? <laughs> Too long ago. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, so you can also think about your own current environment and how teaching happens with, within your current um, place of work. And um, again, is that long and thin or short and fat or, or something mixed mode? Yeah, so I think we're seeing lots of long and thins, which is what we might expect, since that's mostly the, the traditional way that things, are, things have been done. So um, let's have a little look, look at the, the timetable of, um, of how things happened. And as I've mentioned already, um, initially it was often done in terms or semesters, um, and often it was arranged for practical reasons. And I'm now going to be talking more or less about the education system in the US, um, who originally, I think, took the idea of semesters from Germany but then um, we'll talk about some of the developments in the US. In the 1800s, they, they started to introduce summer sessions in addition to the semesters. And these would be used as a catch up. So it would be used to catch up from um, people who had maybe failed to pass a module or missed out on a module that they really wanted to study, which would be important for their, um, their major as they were going on. Or it might be to stretch so that they were doing something outside of the, the, the normal courses and, and um, doing something in a little bit more depth. So these would be shorter summer sessions. And then later, um, around the 1960s, they started having intersessions, which might have been short sessions held at other times of the year, so perhaps in the, um, in the winter break. And then in the 1990s, certain institutions introduced alternative length sessions as part of the regular timetable. So running alongside the semester long courses or quarter long courses, they would have shorter sessions, which often was added to improve student choice. So this was to allow students to um, study sessions that were shorter in, in a block that might run alongside some um, other activities such as paid work or um, caring activities and so on. So this was, again, a practical reason, but for student choice. And there have been a great number of reviews and studies on the efficacy of the shorter sessions, because they've always been treated with some suspicion. But um, a lot of the studies have shown that blocked delivery results in the same um, attainment or better attainment um, compared with the traditional approach. And once the, um, the alternative le length sessions came in that were um, within an institution that was also running longer sessions, then there were some very large studies um, undertaken there. And they, these would be the same equivalent modules um, run over different time periods and with the same student body and um, very often the same teaching staff. And what was found was that the shorter modules gave better results. Now, there are quite a number of methodological issues with these types of studies, because usually the, the students are um, self-selecting to take the um, short, short fat modules. And so they've selected to do those and, um, and they, they've um, then hopefully been able to, to um, do well on those, those different types of modules. And, and there are some references here and there is a full reference list in the, in the slide deck. Um, but then there are also some um, instances where the timetable has been changed for pedagogic reasons. And one of the first um, places that that happened was in some small liberal arts colleges where they introduced something called a block plan. And I'll, I'll let you have a read of the description of the block plan here at Colorado College. So here, the idea that was when it was introduced was to enable deep learning and really focusing on a particular topic in depth. So it was, it was introduced for um, pedagogic reasons 
And the institutions where this um, type of, of um, blocked approach is used, they've reviewed it constantly. So they've been reviewing it since they introduced it. And um, the, the Colorado College is now 50, 50 years on from when they first introduced it. And so there's quite a lot of information there looking back at the, the block plan. But they're very happy with it. And they get positive results. They get high levels of satisfaction from their staff and students um, in general. And, and again, I suppose to an extent, there is a degree of self-selection here um, where, where students are choosing this, these colleges because of the approach that they adopt. And another um, change that was introduced more recently for pedagogic reasons was at Victoria University in Australia, where in, the, um, in, in 2020, they introduced across their whole institution blocked delivery. So the top part shows the four units, followed by the SWOT fac, um, and then exams. And then they changed it to having four short fac units running one after the other, with some developmental activities running alongside, which were mostly study skills and so on. And so the idea of that, the aim of, of this change um, was to support students from non-traditional backgrounds. And they really wanted to reduce how complex it was, having one thing going on at a time rather than having a very complex um, timetable with many modules running concurrently. And they thought that this would help with the transition to university study for students from non-traditional backgrounds. So they've now had a chance to analyse that after one year. So they looked at the blocked mode of teaching versus the two previous years of traditional teaching. And it was big numbers. They had very big numbers within this study. And they saw a really significant increase in marks of over 11% in, on average. And they found that the largest impact was on the, the non-traditional students that they were hoping to target. So I think that that was something they were very, very pleased with. And they had a small increase in satisfaction with teaching, but a decrease in course satisfaction. And a lot of that was to do with, with the workload or the, um, the difficulty of, of um, focusing on, on the studies. Um, but it, that was somewhat mitigated when the assessments had been changed for the blocked module, modules. And that's something very important because Although you want to be covering the same, the same type of material, you really um, can't just teach in the same way. You can't take 40 lectures, which are normally spread over 10 weeks, and squish them all down into, into three or four weeks. Um, that's just too much to take in. And so I think that an impact of changing to block teaching is that it requires more active learning, more discussion, more peer um, peer review and peer, peer um, work and group work and so on. So that's one of the, the changes that seems to come about when you change from um, long and thin to short and fat. So traditional or blocked, which is, which is better? I think that we can say that really either approach can work and um, that but that, but that is providing that you change your pedagogic approach and have your pedagogic approach align with the delivery mode. So there are different strengths and weaknesses. For example, some students are really positive about social aspects of learning and motivation in block mode, and some are concerned about the amount of, of um, work that's involved or the amount of time that's involved focusing on this one topic. There are also different requirements for teaching, learning and assessment. And I've given a couple of, of references there to, um, to papers that discuss some of those requirements. And I think if, if there's going to be a change in delivery mode, then it really pays for us as learning technologists to help the academics to think through the benefits and the drawbacks and the design that's required for the, um, the different delivery mode. I think it does a, a rethink and a redesign in terms of teaching approach, the admin processes that surround that the modules, the guidance given to students and the type of assessment. So now I want to turn that over to you and to um, think about this in a Padlet and um, hopefully um, someone will post that Padlet in the, um, in the chat for you. 
And um, I'd like you to think, think it through and put benefits and drawbacks of each of the different delivery modes. And um, also to think about it through different points of view from teachers, from staff, from students, from administrative staff, and also in different disciplines, because different disciplines may have different um, issues and requirements as well. So um, I'd like to hand over to, to you now to be um, working on the Padlet and adding in information. Um, and I will try and put this up on my screen. There we are. So you've got some there as a starter. And um, yes, please, please give me the, the benefits of your experience and, and your thoughts. I should also mention that if you're logged into Padlet, then um, your posts will come up as um, without any name. But if you make a comment, then we'll show your name in the comment. So if you don't want to have your name shown, which would be also shown um, in the recording and in the Padlet itself, then uh, you should log out from Padlet at this point.
Great, thank you. Thanks, Moira. Did you want to pick up on any of the comments that have been made in the Padlet before we go to any questions that anyone might have for you? I, I think that um, what's great is just to see so many different comments coming into the Padlet from, from different um, points of view, which, which is great. And looking at it um, about the, um, the resourcing and the admin aspects and the teaching aspects, as well as looking at it from the student point of view. And um, I think we've also got some, some um, comments about different types of subject areas as well, um, which I, th I think can be an issue. Um, yeah, I think one of the issues that sometimes people, people see is with the um, repeated practice over time, which might be, um, might be quite important for learning in certain subject areas, uh, particularly in maths. Um, so yeah, and then I'm, I'm very happy to take take questions and um, and have people still still contributing to the Padlet if they wish. Thank you. So, um, Deb, have you know? Uh, is, has anyone got um, any questions that they would like to ask more? If you could just put it into the chat, we do have a minute or two left. Um, whilst people are thinking about questions, where I had a question, which was to ask, what um, in your um, institution, what are you, which are you adopting now? What what place are you at with um, this type of yeah. um, learning? So I think um, it's quite strange. I work in the natural sciences faculty, and one of our departments uses blocked mode, and the other departments more or less use. Um, the traditional mode throughout, but in um, our maths department, they've just moved to um, to having a, a single block at the beginning of the academic year to ease the transition, and then they move into the um, the traditional, um, you know, long thin consecutive mode after that. Um, but I, I think that one of the the reasons why I was quite interested in this is because of the changes that happened. I was not going to mention the pandemic, but <laughs> let's mention how some some oh, places, that thing. <laughs> <laughs> some places um, have actually um, adopted a blocked timetable um, during the pandemic so that they yeah. could just um, have a focus on certain modules and then with the idea that they might come back to, um, to a more traditional way of teaching subsequently. So yeah, so I think it's a real mix in that. And online programmes as well might often think of having a, a blocked mode um, rather than the consecutive mode, just to, to have that focus. Yes, yeah, so she was asking if I have a preference. Yeah. And I, I don't I don't think really, I think that it is, you know, horses for courses and what's the what's the best thing. And I, I noticed, I don't know if it was you, Sheila, who was saying that, that Tim, that you've had things going backwards and forwards from one mode to the other and, um, I think that must be really quite hard. Yeah, about swapping them around is um, is probably quite hard. Um, I'm quite surprised with the the institutions in the states where they've adopted the same model for 50 years, and they are still going strong with it. Um, I think we're at time actually, so we don't have yeah. any time for other any <laughs> other questions. But if everyone could. Um, you know, find your best emoji to thank Moira for her presentation. And um, no, um, Mo Moira is engaging with um, the Discord. So if you've got any other questions for her, you can follow up with her in that space or on Twitter. Thank you, Moira. Yeah, thank you all. In. Thank you all for your um, <laughs> for your comments and, and everything on the Padlet, which will, will I hope, grow um, over time as well. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks.